Hello everyone and welcome to this presentation. My name is Sohil and I'm going to be talking about client-side request hijacking vulnerabilities on the web platform. So before we start, who am I? A couple of words about me. I'm a security researcher at CISPA, Center for Information Security in Saarland, uh, Germany. I'm part of the AppSec team. You see the picture here in the slides. Uh, so my research interest lies in the intersection of application security Program analysis, meaning lots of static dynamic analyses, um, and all that in the web ecosystem. And prior to that, I was a researcher and developer in multiple companies, in Amdal Software in Madrid, in Fraunhofer, and in Brooktech. And with that, we can start uh, the real start of the show uh, with web applications. So web applications today, uh, accept and process plethora of um, user input. Uh, they have turned into a digital playground for users to input their thoughts, feelings, or their favorite cat videos in more ways than we have ever imagined. And these inputs come in many different forms and many different types of applications, uh, ranging from social media applications to email to Git repositories like markdown descriptions that you write to uh, posts on WordPress, CMS applications, um, so all these like user inputs. And since uh, the early days of the web, uh, developers have been trying to tame this wild west of uh, user inputs because, of course, input can go wrong. We can have like a malformed uh, input, adversarial input. And the lingering question since then was, are we validating all these input data properly? Um, so to answer this question, let's take a step back and have a look at where do these inputs come from uh, in the first place. So of course, these inputs can be from like uh, the same site from the first parties. So you go to a site, 9.com. There is some form. You fill in the form with probably your personal information, with your credit card number, all the sensitive information. And then there will be a request from the UI to the backend. But we also have... Uh, uh, inputs from other sites, from third parties, uh, because of integrations with social media platforms, uh, payment gateways, all those external services that are custom to the application logic. And um, to have these inputs transferred from those third parties to first parties, we will need to use cross-site requests, so requests from one site to the other site. And also these cross-site requests um, add uh, new functionality, they also introduce new security risks because uh, first party need to assume that these are authorized services so we can trust these parties. And now it has a challenge uh, that it has to tackle is who, do, who should we trust and who, sh who should we not trust? So now the question is, okay, wait, who made this request to me? How can we know who uh, which party in this complex web of service-to-service -service communication uh, initiated a request, sent us a request, and how can we uh, know that in advance so that we can um, let the trusted requests go through and reject untrusted ones? So the solution is very simple. We can trust requests based on authentication authorization. We authenticate users' browsers, for instance, with account credentials, before send, sending sensitive requests. Or for services, we used authorization, meaning we have like API keys, authorization tokens, um, that applications use to know exactly which first party or third party um, initiated the request so that we can simply reject the untrusted ones. And with this authentication authorization properly enforced, it seems that, yeah, we are mostly fine. Well, it turned out 20 years ago, it, it's not the case. Why? Because of the confused deputy flaw. What is confused deputy flaw? It means that attackers can trick trusted parties into performing sensitive but unintended operations. So you could think about it as you go to your um, banking website, you log into the banking application, um, and then on, on the different tab of your browser, you go to an attack page, um, and the attack page can use your browser, which is a trusted party, to send an authenticated request to your bank and cause um, um, a damage uh, if the banking application is vulnerable. 
So now the question is, how do we check for the user intention? Because we have to know if this trusted party sent a request that was actually intentional by the, by the user. What happens if we don't check this user intention? We will have an attack called cross-site request forgery. So there is a request being sent, and this request is between two sites, for instance, from the attack site and the banking website that you were, you were in. And here the attacker is tricking your user's browser to send an authenticated request that is causing a, a persistent state change. And this state change could be an illicit money transfer, could be a post on the social media account, could be anything that changes the uh, state of the application persistently and is security relevant. And the root cause of this attack is that the server cannot um, um, distinguish which requests was uh, intentional. Um, so how it works, victim goes to an attack page, attack.com. Uh, this attack page includes some resource from some benign sites, say socialmedia.com. And then the browser automatically includes the session cookies of the victim um, in, this, in this request. So there is a cross-site request. And as a result of this, uh, there will be a write to the database, for example, a status update post. And this is known as uh, cross-site request forgery, or shortly CSER. So over the past many years, fortunately, uh, researchers, engineers, uh, security community has come up with plethora of robust defenses against uh, cross-site request forgery attacks. So cross-site request forgery attacks are an old news. We know how to defend against them. Um, we could have like origin checks. So if we can, we can check if the request is coming, for instance, from attack.com. And if that's the case, just block the request. Um, browsers nowadays implement um, built-in um, defense in-depth solutions like same site cookies uh, to restrict the scope of cookies when they are transmitted uh, from one site to the other one. So, uh, for example, um, uh, Chromium-based browsers now have same site equal lax policy by default, and lax by default means that uh, cookies are restricted to a mostly first-party context. So this will not be feasible anymore. And um, uh, on the top of that, we have like these token-based defenses because these requests operate based on the assumption that an attacker can reliably reconstruct the request, meaning there is no random element inside the request. So as a defender, if you add some randomness to this request, the attacker cannot uh, repeat the request and therefore you can prevent it. And it seems that with these defenses properly enforced, of course, there could be like uh, implementation flaws. But assuming these defenses are uh, properly enforced, it seems that CIS of attack uh, can be solved. And um, what we question ourselves is that is this really the case? And did we solve CIS of attacks? So what we, uh, if you look at the uh, picture we had before, what we saw was that we had this uh, third-party request and we, had, we solved the uh, confused DPD flow for a cross-site request. But let's take a second look at first-party requests, the requests that come from the same site. And can we have somehow the confused DPD flow for same site requests? And how is that even possible? So back in 2019, my advisor actually uh, sent me this uh, blog post uh, from Facebook bug bounty um, of a vulnerability called client side CSERF and asked me to, to look into it. So what's client side CSERF? Um, so in this vulnerability, attackers uh, exploit input validation vulnerabilities in JavaScript programs to hijack um, asynchronous requests. So, assume we have a victim uh, user that uh, goes to an attack page. The attack page, similarly to the previous scenario, sends a request to the social media site. And now the social media site contains this benign but uh, vulnerable script. What it does is that it reads some part of the URL, for example, the hash fragment. Hash fragment is the part that comes after the hash symbol in a URL. And uh, changing that part does not cause a navigation event, does not reload the page. So imagine we have an application like this that reads this uh, input from the user and use it as the endpoint to which an asynchronous request is sent. 
Um, now if you have an adversary that uh, has control over this URL because this is the adversary that is sending this request, so it can put his malicious payload here. And as a result of this, we will have a request submitted to this endpoint here, uh, which will cause, again, a security-relevant state change to the application. So basically, we still have the confused deputy flow because this is not an intentional request. Um, but the root cause of this confused deputy flow is now input validation, which is similarly to cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. Uh, which again leads to security relevant implications. For instance, in the case of um, um, uh, Facebook bug bounty report that I showed you, this reported, uh, this affected Instagram, uh, and it was possible to post the status update. So let's go deeper inside this um, vulnerability. So we had a piece of JavaScript code that performs a request to a CSAF protected um, GraphQL API endpoints upon page load. So this request is submitted automatically as soon as the page is loaded. And it actually affects business Instagram. So there is a piece of code like this. So it reads some URL. Of course, this is greatly simplified and uh, sends it to this uh, endpoint. And this is a post request. And it has a valid anti-forgery token or access token. So all the legitimate credentials, authentication, authorization that the application uses here are not valid because, are, are not working because the request is coming from the same site. So this part of the request was basically not validated. Um, so the attacker can control the endpoint to which the JavaScript code makes the um, HTTP request and um, the, in the case of business Instagram, it was possible to uh, change it to a different GraphQL endpoint, uh, particularly for posting a new status on behalf of the um, user victim. So starting from that uh, example, um, we were wondering if client-side CSERF is the only issue uh, where you can hijack requests. So in fact, we studied this problem uh, in one of the publications we had in Usenix Security in 21, and there we focused on only fetch API and XML HTTP requests, uh, similarly to the one that affected um, Instagram. But if you think about the web browser, there are many types of requests that a web browser can, can send. There are web sockets, there are server sent events, there are push notifications. Um, even considering the, the send beacon, uh, the, the uh, asynchronous request, there is an API called send beacon, that allows you to send um, analytic information to the backend just before the page is unloaded. So imagine that you're on a page, uh, you click on something and uh, you'll be redirected in a second to a different page, but the website wants to store some analytic information just before the navigation happens. And this occurs uh, via the Send Beacon API, and this is the post requests. And 35% of the API calls for asynchronous requests are based on the Send Beacon API. So what we wanted to understand was which browser APIs allows you to uh, send a request in a browser and what are the security implications if an attacker can control these requests through one of the injection points to, for instance, uh, URL parameters. The second aspect was that, okay, now this is a threat. Uh, we don't have any measurement available. We don't know how prevalent is this problem in the wild. Is this really something that affects a lot of websites or it, was the Instagram case only an isolated um, single issue? Um, so we wanted to be able to detect these types of problems automatically and understand their prevalence in the broader web ecosystem. And Third, uh, because these um, newer variants of uh, request hijacking or CSERF um, bypass all the known existing countermeasures of CSERF, we were wondering what countermeasures and defenses are um, effective. How can developers uh, protect their applications um, um, against this class of vulnerabilities and what are the efficacy of um, various countermeasures? So starting with the first questions, so we uh, compiled the list of request sending APIs from um, uh, uh, W3C and Wodweg, which is the standard for uh, webs. 
Um, and there we looked into like configurable fields. So what are the fields that uh, users can uh, configure for each API, like URL body headers? What are the network schemes and methods? So uh, you could have a post request, get request, put request. Uh, you could have HTTP scheme, you could have the JavaScript scheme. And what are the default constraints these um, APIs are subject to? So for instance, most APIs are subject to same origin policy, to same set cookies, but uh, web sockets are, for instance, uh, exempted from same origin policy. So we identified 10 request APIs across six different request categories, and these are the, like the APIs and the relevant specs, and these are the schemes, methods, or generally the capabilities that you have with these APIs. And then we examine the security impact when an attacker controls one or more inputs of these APIs. So uh, let's do a bit of thread modeling and assume that an attacker can control the urine of an asynchronous request. It can cause clients to C-serve, but it can also cause information leakage if the request contains some personal information, security sensitive information, and you can send that to an attacker controlled domain. Or if you can forge like the URL or the destination of top level URLs, uh, you can set their destination to JavaScript alert one, it can cause client side access, or it can cause open redirections and so on. So we identified 10 distinct variants uh, of these vulnerabilities, client side request hijacking vulnerabilities. Seven of these are uh, new vulnerabilities that not, we did not know so far, we didn't consider them, and two are new variants, meaning now we have a new API that uh, resembles the same vulnerability. And the details of these are in our application, and you can check it out. But I don't want to go into the detail for the moment. So this is an example of the information leakage. So here you can reroute requests containing sensitive information to attacker controlled domain. So again, imagine that we have this code on uh, example website. Um, the body contains CSERF tokens, authorization keys, PIIs. Um, if you submit, if you send this request redirected to your own domain, you can gain access to these tokens and then perform CSERF attacks, but also like all other types of um, problems if the request contains sensitive information to the user. And here, one thing to note is that uh, the course headers um, that isolate websites from one another are completely ineffective here um, because um, the request is being sent to the attacker domain, so attackers have full access over uh, these headers. Another um, interesting trick to hijack requests in web applications um, is DOM clobbering. So let's see what is DOM clobbering. Imagine that we have this web page, example.com, that has this DOM tree, which is basically a representation of the elements in, in the web page, like buttons, uh, input fields, and so on. And we have a piece of code that looks like this. So the developer is writing some variable, to, uh, writing some um, fixed content to a variable called document.globalconfig, and then later using um, uh, whatever it was written above, um, to an SRC of a script tag. So here we have a, a request to fetch a JavaScript code, and here we are setting its SRC to document.globalconfig.src. So it seems at first sight just a simple um, write and then subsequent read, which seems benign. But uh, if an attacker manages to inject a piece of seemingly benign markup like this, is an image tag with id global config, src malicious.js. Then document.globalconfig will no longer point to this variable, which was on the code, but now will point to the injected markup. So essentially, DOM clobbering is a namespace confusion attack where the markup id collides with sensitive variables or APIs and overwrites them. And how can the attacker inject this markup? Well, many applications accept markup as input. Think about the uh, readme uh, in Git repositories, right? So it's a markdown. You can put HTML there. It will be converted to uh, HTML or uh, WordPress post and so on. And of course, this results in arbitrary code execution on the client side. So this is the whole holy grail uh, thread that you can have on the, on the web. The so why dumb clobbering happens um, it's because of the way locating elements on the DOM works. Um, so the clean way to do this is 
using Domcray selectors, whereas the dirty way is probably access a window or document object, which is actually a legacy feature. Meaning, if you have these three of elements in our document, and we want to select node and five in these three, um, the robust way to, to query that element is to say document dot get element by ID or query selector ID equal Y. Whereas the legacy way to, to do this that browsers enabled you to do that is just to say document.x.y. So you first come to uh, the parent children and then you navigate to the child uh, with this one. Or window.y, um, you can directly access this. And this is called, according to their specification, named access on the window and document object. And based on this uh, rule, um, um, uh, if you have a node uh, in the DOM tree that has the same name as that of a variable that the developer defined, uh, those IDs will come before and overshadow the developer defined variables. And now this legacy feature is used in almost 11% of the pages um, in the wild according to the Google Chrome telemetry statistics. And based on our measurements, these 11% actually correspond to half of the websites on the, on the web, so we cannot simply turn this legacy feature off because you will break half of the web. So we cannot get rid of DOM clobbering. We have to live with it. And why is it important? Well, because it uh, can lead to request hijacking vulnerabilities. An example is um, a request hijacking in Gmail's um, MP4 email sanitizer 2019. So Remember that emails also are HTML, so you actually write HTML in, in your email. And um, how, how was the vulnerability? So Gmail actually offers a um, feature called dynamic mail that not allows you to not only input some text and styles, but also like to add scripts and forms in your emails. And this is how the code looked like in Gmail. So there was this variable called window.testlocation. Um, and later on, um, there was a script tag whose value was set to this um, um, location that an attacker could control by injecting um, some piece of HTML that looked like uh, this. And this would have caused arbitrary code execution, but fortunately, Gmail had um, content security policy that mitigated this vulnerability. Um, now, DOM clobbering is an issue. What can we do about it to prevent request hijacking? Um, so we created this uh, uh, framework that allows you to automatically identify um, um, all the different clobbering markups. So we created about 24 million test cases. We tested it in 19 different browsers, mobile and desktop browsers, covering all the permutations of tags, attributes, relationships, uh, targets, like variables you could have in JavaScript and HTML to try to figure out um, how you could overwrite variables um, and those variables could be used as the endpoint of requests. And we uncovered 31,000 distinct markups across different techniques. Of, of these, 40, 481 were previously unknown. So I don't want to go into the details, but again, this is an example of a markup, how it looks. So if you want to uh, clobber or uh, overwrite a variable uh, being x dot y, you can uh, inject the payload like this that internally abuses a, 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 a dictionary style object called HTML collection. Um, and we have a website on which you can test like different browsers um, and uh, you have these uh, uh, markdowns uh, all publicly accessible as domcop.xyz. And we have also an attack payload uh, generator service so you, you could go there and you could say I want to clobber uh, over, overshadow this variable and uh, make it uh, malicious.js and you will get a list of attack payloads. So we have DOM clobbering as one way to hijack requests. But coming back to answering the first question, um, how many of these APIs, uh, request APIs do we have in the wild? Uh, so we did a large scale measurement on um, 1 million pages of uh, Tranco top 10K sites. And we found 7.9 million um, API calls using one of these 10 um, APIs. And the most widespread requests are um, top-level navigation requests via location.href uh, API. And these are present in more than 80% um, of the, the sites we, we tested. 
Um, on the other hand, the most frequently used ones are the ones uh, based on XML Azure requests that have almost 3 million calls across 400 pages. So what do we learn from all this? Uh, the widespread usage of these requested related APIs presents a very attractive attack surface for, for hackers. And second, the request hijacking threats have not been considered for 44% of these API calls by prior work if we just look at the type of the requests uh, that we have. So what we did was we proposed a framework to automatically detect these new vulnerabilities using a combination of static and dynamic analysis. And this framework is based on um, an earlier tool we created uh, called JavaScript Analysis Framework Jaw. And the code name for version 3 is called Sheriff, which allows you to detect these vulnerabilities. So let's go into the details and see how this uh, vulnerability works. First, we have a data collection a system that allows you to collect the client-side code of the application and also collect dynamic data flows. So here we want to find data flows from um, program inputs, like if you uh, have instructions that read from uh, URL to security-sensitive um, APIs that send uh, requests. So here we have uh, an array of browsers that use uh, our instrumented Firefox browser called Foxound to uh, collect uh, web pages and data flows. And when we have this, um, we do some pre-processing to uh, deduplicate web pages. So imagine a website like YouTube. You, uh, if you consider two pages that you can watch two different videos and under the hood, they have pretty much the same piece of JavaScript code. Um, although the content is different. So what we want to do is to uh, merge these two different URLs um, into a single one and analyze them only once in this step. And then we create a model. Um, um, that these models are essentially graphs that allow you to um, navigate these graphs by a certain path for vulnerability detection. Uh, and they are called code property graphs or hybrid property graphs. And then uh, we import these graphs into a Neo4j database, and then you have um, various queries similarly to CodeQL for vulnerability discovery. So we have an array of uh, queries for different types of requests, and we want to detect data flows from uh, input sources, where, like uh, sources where an attacker can control to different uh, request sending instructions in handling all the different sanitization instructions that we can have. And once this static analyzer found data flows, we confirm all the data flows automatically via runtime monitoring. So we um, uh, like load the web page in a browser, put some payload, and check um, if the payload actually goes through. So this tool, you can access it on uh, jaw.me. It's open source, and um, you can play around with it. Um, so one of the main contributions of our tool was this part to combine static and dynamic analysis together to create an um, um, advanced graph because static analysis has limitations. So there could be features that static analysis in the code that static analyzers fail to model. So we, what we wanted to do was to um, enrich this static representation with um, values we observe from um, runtime monitoring and dynamic analysis. So we created this model called PaintFlow Augmented Hybrid Property Graphs, and to tell you quickly what that is. So we have a graph like this uh, that, uh, that uh, combines several graphs. It's called Property Graph, which is um, a combination of multiple static analysis models, like the syntax tree, control flow graph, data flow graph, call graph, all these graphs that static analyzers use normally. And then if you add concrete runtime values, like if you add the value that this variable had at a certain point in time, this is called hybrid property graph. And the, our idea was that we want to do data flow analysis to track the propagation of attacker control values. So if you have a, a URL here that follows some paths to reach um, these HTTP requests here, uh, but our problem is that there are missing edges inside this graph that do not allow us to traverse this graph. So this is what we proposed. We proposed um, using dynamic analysis to reconstruct these edges, and we have a dynamic um, uh, instrumented browser called Foxound uh, that allow you to detect um, 
these missing edges and add them in the static model. And again, the instrumented browser is open source. Okay, so having this tool, we conducted an empirical study to quantify the prevalence of client-side request hijacking vulnerabilities in the wild. We tested to encode top 10K websites, uh, processing over 32 billion lines of JavaScript code, and uh, um, more than uh, uh, 339,000 uh, unique web pages. And our results were uh, alarming. We detected over 202,000 verified data flows from attacker controlled sources to uh, requests uh, across 961 sites, which is basically nine for 9.6 percent of the uh, top websites um, on the web. And the new vulnerability types and variants that we detected uh, um, considered over 36 percent of these cases. And the dynamic information that was used to reconstruct the missing edges was crucial to detect 67% of these dynamic data flows. So if you use static analysis alone, there will be a lot of cases that you miss due to JavaScript complexity. So we have all these data flows, um, and we were wondering how bad is the problem? Can we exploit these data flows to cause some damage um, to the applications? And our goal was to uh, demonstrate exploitability because we had plethora of requests, like 200 to 1,000 requests. Uh, so we did not want to create exploit for every single one of them because that's uh, very challenging. But instead, we want to just demonstrate that they are exploitable. So we focused on a random subset. So we picked two requests randomly from each of the vulnerable sites. And then we checked their forgeability and looked for their use in an attack. So for example, is the site uh, validating JavaScript URLs uh, for a top level request? Otherwise, we can achieve cross-site scripting. Um, is there any server-side endpoint that triggers state changes um, if, if there are st uh, state changing get requests that we can use to uh, cause a CSRF attacks? Uh, is the, are those, do those requests contain uh, sensitive information? So we have a request, but we don't know if this contains sensitive information so that the attacker can um, redirect it to their own domain and steal this sensitive information. Um, are those requests uh, susceptible to open redirect vulnerabilities and so on? And we actually uh, were able to create, out of these 961 sites, we were able to create um, exploits for 49 sites, and this includes very popular ones such as Microsoft Azure, Stars, Google DoubleClick, TP-Link, which allows you to actually uh, achieve um, uh, very critical stuff like arbitrary code execution, account takeover, data exfiltration, and so on. So now I'm going to show you a couple of examples of these um, exploits. So this is an example of the vulnerability we detected in Microsoft Azure. It's now confirmed and patched. Um, so the impact was that uh, you could change like they use the settings, but ultimately this was escalated to client side XSS. So technically you could do anything, uh, from this point onwards since it's an XSS. Of course, the code is greatly simplified, uh, for explainability, but just to tell you how it works. So there was this parameter that is read from, uh, the query parameter called request. And then, then the, this was used in a, uh, top level navigation request. Uh, via location that assign. And an attacker can set this value to JavaScript alert one, uh, which will in turn hijack the request and cause an uh, access vulnerability. So another example, uh, very much similar effect at uh, the TP-Link site. This is again confirmed and patched. And here the program is not doing any input validation at all. It's just reading the query parameter URL and then using it as a value location.href. Interestingly, the only input validation is checking if the screen width is less than 124 pixels, which means that the attack works if the screen size is smaller than that. Um, so this is an, another example in BBC, um, uh, which, with which I want to show the contribution of dynamic analysis of why that is important. So we have this piece of code. Uh, there is a CSF token here, um, and static analysis alone uh, will fail to detect this issue. So this CSRF token goes to um, a request that is dynamically generated. So we have this piece of code here, HTTP POST request this function that sends this request. Um, but this function is this function call is actually stored in an array, which is called here, which in turn calls this function. So this is very hard to, to be detected by a static analysis because of dynamic property lookups. 
But what we, what we do is that if we combine static and dynamic analysis, we can reconstruct these edges on the graph. I don't want to go into the details again, but just to highlight, we can reconstruct these like co-edges to be able to detect this um, uh, client-side request hijacking vulnerability in BBC. Uh, now we also tested uh, business applications. So these were live websites, but we also tested business applications. And this is an example from uh, Suit CRM, uh, where you can like delete accounts, tasks, or tickets. Um, so this vulnerability actually affects a library called uh, YUI, Yahoo Util library. And what was happening is that the, the code is calling some function called first load. Um, and here it is getting basically the hash fragment upon page load. So this uh, part in uh, orange. And then it is using it as a part of a post request. Uh, and because you can control the URL, you can control where to send the request, which in turn will cause a CSAF attack. Another example is in Cotton Tea. And here, again, you can forge authenticated requests to any sensitive endpoint, but you control not only the URL, but also the uh, request method. So you have this uh, piece of code that allows you to um, control the method and URL. And uh, the actual type payload looks like something like this. Uh, again, you have the hash fragment here. You specify the URL um, and uh, this particular attack payload. And what it does is that it changes the admi uh, administrative configuration of the website. And in this particular case, it will auto-delete all inactive accounts that are older than one minute, so which is basically all the accounts on the, the website will be deleted by this um, CSRF uh, uh, vulnerability. And another flow in this application is that it's using GET requests uh, to trigger state changes, which should not be the case uh, based on the RFC. Um, those should be done with POST, uh, DELETE, and such requests. Okay, so we see that request hijacking threats are really, really serious, and there are a plethora of these requests that can be exploited in very popular applications. So what can we do about it, and how can we defend, uh, defend about it? Um, so in terms of defenses, we, uh, one of the effective ones is content security policy. And uh, the useful policy for CSP is connect SRC. So what it does is that if you set it on your web page, this will constrain the request endpoints to trusted domains. So basically, attacker cannot have data exfiltration, cannot set the URL to their own domains. Um, but this does not prevent a request hijack for CSERF attack for same site endpoints. But at least it will mitigate the cause of uh, information leakage. So if you look at our dot set, even with the correct CSP configuration, 41% of the vulnerabilities cannot be mitigated uh, this way. Another policy that we have in the browser is called cross-origin open a policy, or shortly COOP. And this restricts the, the browsing context um, given to the attacker via the window.open API to same origin documents. And it's only effective when window.open API is, is used. Um, and again, this provides some level of uh, protection for a mi minor fraction of the sites, but the majority of the uh, vulnerabilities cannot be prevented by COOP alone. However, you can combine CSP and COOP to achieve some layer of uh, extra layer of defense. Now, there are all other defenses, cross origin and policy and fetch metadata, but they are all similarly uh, less effective and have an effectiveness of uh, uh, five to six percent, give or take. Um, as opposed to these policy-based uh, solutions given to you uh, by by browsers, there are also custom solutions that application developers can use, particularly input validations. Um, and what we did was that we analyzed these vulnerable data flows that uh, we had to detect insecure input validation patterns, to understand what is it that the developers are doing wrong and what they can uh, fix. So we identified eight distinct uh, patterns um, across three types of issues. Uh, first of all, in 47% 40, uh, of the cases, which is basically half of the cases, there were no checks at all. So the first thing that you have to do is that you have, you have to make sure that you sanitize the user input, which basically we go back to score one, back to slide one, 
Are we validating user inputs? Apparently not in half of the cases. Um, the other cases were that the, the validation that we do is insufficient. So we have like trivial checks like lens che uh, checks, type checks, um, or substring checks. So if you have checks for uh, benign.com, this can be trivially bypassed by benign.com.evil.com, right? So this will pass these if checks. So such checks are in insufficient, and I, I think instead of reinventing the wheel, we have to make sure that we use like uh, sanitization libraries such as dump purify and so on that are robust against um, HTML uh, input. And against uh, custom input, we have to make sure that our logic um, uh, is not flawed. The third one is that the check itself is completely, um, does not make sense, is a logical problem. So for example, if you co compare two attacker controlled uh, in values with one another, so if you uh, compare a query parameter to a value by a window name because developers forget that window name is also another value that is attacker controlled. So uh, we have to make sure that the trust boundaries are correct and uh, we assume that window name is trusted, it is really trusted. But this case actually constitutes a very uh, small fraction of the cases, so 3%. So what did we learn uh, about this? Uh, uh, talk after, say, five years of work, more or less, in request hijacking. First, do not open the links given to you by your advisor. Otherwise, you end up uh, working five years in this. But jokes apart, um, so what we found was that clients at CSERF is only one instance of the larger issue of request hijacking. Um, is only the tip of the iceberg. It affects 9.6% of the sites is ubiquitous on the web platform. Um, it can have diverse consequences. It's not only uh, CSRF only. It can cause information leakage, open redirection, and so on. And finally, existing defenses that we have are necessary but insufficient, so you have to add extra layers of defenses, defending depths to lower the risk of um, exploitations. And with that, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to talk. Uh, do you have any questions? you mentioned uh, also mitigated if you're using, for instance, uh, Angular or uh, yeah, some other front-end framework? Yeah, yeah. If, uh, so many of the websites that we uh, tested uh, actually use such libraries like React, Angular, and stuff. So it's not that the library itself is vulnerable, but it's just that the application, the custom logic of the application is vulnerable. Yeah. Actually, this this type of issue is more prevalent than single page applications that are developed with Angular, React, and such libraries because you tend to use these hash fragments there to avoid page reloads. So those applications are actually more susceptible to this uh, type of issue. More on the legacy JavaScript, TypeScript yeah. Yeah. JQuery. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. hear me? All good? Okay, I hear me, so that's good. Uh, first of all, thank you for the great talk. Very interesting. Um, my question is, do you have any recommendations you could offer for security testers in terms of methodology? Um, you know, from what I was looking at, a lot of this would be covered under looking at the paradigm of, you know, DOM-based process scripting, evaluating, looking for the sources and the sinks, and, and looking at the, the trace of, uh, uh, of, you know, parsing of uh, attacker-controlled uh, data, but... Um, you know, beyond the, the techniques employed using tools like, you know, Perf's DOM Invader or whatever else is out there, I was wondering if you could offer any recommendations for, for automation or just testing in general. Yeah, I, I think, f f first of all, I, uh, you're more than welcome to, to t uh, try our tools. So we have Foxound and Jaw that will allow you to detect these types of vulnerabilities or similar ones. 
But from my personal understanding, there is no, it's not about the individual tool that you use, but it's rather more about like the techniques. But these fancy techniques are often like very heavy. So, uh, probably they're just proof of concept to like research prototypes, um, that are far behind, uh, like active deployment, uh, like in, uh, industrial setting. But on the other hand, the industrial tools that you have are far behind, can, uh, will only cover the attack surface uh, for you, will not be able to detect uh, deeper vulnerabilities. So the best strategy forward will to use a combination of uh, the tools. So use industry tools to cover the attack surface, but then if you want to go deeper, then try to figure out how you can like integrate these solutions into your uh, security testing uh, methodology. Thank you.